Good morning to everyone. This is the Spanish Civil War and today we continue our trip back into 19th century Spain. As you may notice, these episodes are also a bit long, but even if we are leaving a lot of stuff behind, condensing is very hard. We hope in the future we will be able to make more in-depth episodes about whatever you think may be missing. we left Spain with the young queen Isabel II and the moderates of Narvaez in control of the situation as the century reached its equator. Last episode we've said that after the Second Carlist War a bit of stability seemed to have arrived at the country. In 1851 the Spanish state signs a treaty with the Papal States Concordato con la Santa Sede. By this treaty Spain will pay the clergy a salary. But the church will renounce to its claims to the properties that had been confiscated previously by the state. In fact, during the last 20 years, starting with the liberal period brought by Riego, three church confiscations, desamortizaciones, took place, being the most important one, Mendizábal's confiscation of 1836, in the middle of the Carlist War, so here you have another reason for the clergy to support Charles. Another one will take place in 1855 that will also see the communal properties of the small villages and towns being sold. In the map, you can see the division between types of property in Spain at the middle of the 19th century. These confiscations were more intended to provide the state with capital than to proceed with a land redistribution. You see, the, the chunks of land being sold were too big and the state didn't support the confiscation with the creation of a credit system to help common people access the land. So the only people that could afford the land were the rich. These confiscations contributed more and more to create latifundiums and reinforce the figure of the landlord. Spain will become the land of the terratenientes and they will have the reins of the country until well advanced the 20th century. As you may see in this map, from the 1960s. The ulterior confiscation of 1855 that saw villages communal properties worsened the situation for the common people, as they were left without the help that those collective exploited lands used to give them to prevent misery. This last desamortización proposed by Madoff took place during the Vienna Progresista that lasted from 1854 to 1856 and meant the return of Espartero and the Progresistas. To the scenario. It didn't last too long, as you can see. During this period, there was a famine in Galicia derived from the Crimean War, as the wheat was sold to the British instead of being used to feed the Spaniards. In 1856, a sort of counter revolution takes place, and General O'Donnell came to power with the party Union Liberal, the other major party of the period. Under O'Donnell, Spain had its first adventure in Morocco that resulted in a success, even if costful. The Sultan agreed with the terms imposed by the Spaniards and, in this war, another remarkable figure for Spain makes its first appearance, General Prim, who will become Espartero's successor as leader of the Progresistas. So, the Union Liberal government focused in colonial adventures over the world. Meanwhile, in the mainland, things were not improving. There was a peasant uprising in the south of Spain known as the Bread and Cheese Revolution in 1861. The continuous population growth also experienced in other European countries, together with the latifundium system that existed there, meant that there was already a population of 5 million temporary workers that had barely anything to eat. This drama, there are no other words for it, will be a main subject of Spain's history and the main cause of turmoil in the south of Spain until yesterday. Or maybe we could say it could be today. In 1863, government of O'Donnell falls and the moderados under Narvaez come to power again. And the time of repression and recession starts for Spain. But it will just last for a summer, as in April 1865, after the brutal reprisal of some students from the University of Madrid, Narvaez was forced to resign and O'Donnell 
came back to power again. Realized that the liberals are out of the game. They just ruled during the Bienio Progressista and the struggle seems to be between Moderados and Union Liberal, both conservative parties, that will merge in 1874, spoiler alert, to form the Partido Liberal Conservador. O'Donnell takes the driver's place, but just for one year, as in 1866, a garrison from Madrid in the Sublevación del Cuartel de San Gil revolts against the Queen. She wants to get 1,000 prisoners shot, and when O'Donnell refuses and orders just the killing of 66 people, the Queen dismisses him and calls, you guess, the Moderados. The Spain nearby takes control of is in dire straits. Corruption and incompetence had always the grasp over the country, but in 1866 the first capitalistic economic crisis hit Spain. It started with a Catalan textile that was cut out of the Confederate Curon because of the American Civil War. After that, a rail transport crisis explodes, as there were not the people nor the goods to transport with the rail that was just built following speculative interests. The transport rail crisis swallowed banks and the situation just worsened in 1867 and 1868 as a subsistence crisis broke out because of the poor harvests. In 1866, the two left-wing parties of Spain, Partido Democrata and Partido Liberal, under the insistence of General Prim, the African hero, had signed the Costende Pact in order to overthrow the Queen. Notice that since 1840, the main characters of Spain history, the Prime Ministers, are generals. Spartero, O'Donnell, Narvaez. Now the main role comes to Prim. We could say, as Preston suggests, that since 1840, the army was the most powerful institution in Spain, and we could arguably say that the army would never like to renounce this power, not in the 19th century, not at the beginning of the 20th. In 1868, the glorious revolution aimed to overthrow Isabel II takes place. This revolution was started by Admiral Topete, because we were tired of generals, no? The revolution successfully throw, overthrows the Queen, but has not the same luck with the replacement. A provisional government was in church until 1872 and proclaimed a new constitution in 1869. After a diplomatic crisis that led to the Franco-Prussian War, check out the Ems telegram, Amadeo de Savoia was proclaimed King of Spain. He arrived at his new kingdom just to assist at the funeral of his major ally, General Prim, that has been assassinated. This crime was studied again recently. The violent signs found in the mummified body of the general showed the government version of that crime was not true. Still today, an unresolved crime. As the third Carlist War starts, and Amadeo seemed not very comfortable with this Game of Thrones, he abdicates in 1873, and Spain gives birth to its first republic. In order to close for now the chapters of the Carlist Wars, an important, it's important to mention the evolution of the cause. It seems that during the 19th century, when Spain faced a crisis with a sort of opportunistic fashion, the Carlists have been there to take arms for their exiled king. But what the exiled king offered changed during the times. If the first Carlist war was for absolutism, during the second and third Carlist wars, they become more and more a beacon of the decentralized Spaniards opposed to the, to the centralized Spaniards. A refusal of the liberal state and the capitalistic industrial revolution. This will change again during the 30s when they gain ground in Andalusia and again during the civil war when Carlism, after siding with the rebels, will have to renounce most of its claims. After that, a difficult relation with dictator, followed by decisions, etc. But back to that first republic. Let's say that it was divided between unionists and federalists. By their name you can guess their main names. The First Republic had not a very long life. At the beginning of 1874, General Pavia, as the Unionists were about to lose a parliamentary vote that would accelerate the federalization of Spain, occupies the Congress. It's a coup d'etat and the beginning of the end for the Republic. It will last until December under the dictatorship of another general, Serrano, but in December, Martínez de Campos will make a pronunciamento in order to restore King Alfonso XII, the son of Isabel II. 
As during the first half of the 19th century, the struggle in Spain was between absolutism and constitutional monarchy, Preston compares this period, 1873-1874, to the Spring of Nations of 1848-1849. Spain arrived late for lunch. So, we reach the Restauración Borbónica. The main characteristic of this period is, as we are getting used to, corruption and incompetence. General López of Choa will say, quoting a lawyer, that in Spain, robbery and theft just existed for quantities inferior to 100,000 pesetas. And the British attaché will recognize that there were no charts loyal to the nation, but just loyal to Alfonso XII. The first product of this corrupt system was also the way to maintain it, the turnismo parlamentario. There were two main political parties, Partido Conservador and Partido Liberal. To simplify, we'll say that one was in favor of free trade and was supported by the wine and fried producers and also by the Basque that supported iron. The Liberal Party, instead, was protectionist and was supported by the cattle and textile industry and the grain producers that could not compete with England for the textile and Australia or the USA for the grain. The elections were controlled by the caciques, powerful figures that controlled the terminate territories with their influence, bribes and repression. They fabricated the results in the basis of who was supposed to rule the country. The press made the results public even before the elections were held. Since 1868, the country had to face a revolt in Cuba in what will be known as the Big War, or Ten Years' War. It ended in 1878, but the same year, another conflict started that lasted another year. Around 100,000 Spanish soldiers died if we considered both wars, half of them by illness. In 1878, a Republican revolt is crushed, and the King Alfonso XII survives an assassination attempt made by an anarchist. Ten years earlier, Amazon engineer and architect Giuseppe Fanelli arrived in Spain to bring the holy word of anarchism. Alcohol, betting and prostitution must be avoided. Anarchism spread through Spain, mainly in Andalusia and Catalonia. They started with a policy of education, going from town to town creating night schools. One day, if possible, with your support, we'll make a video about the role of anarchism during the 19th and 20th century in Spain. Now, in 1882, a civil guard colonel allegedly found the rule book of a supposed anarchist terrorist group, Mano Negra. With this proof, the anarchist movement was prosecuted with the recently created FTRA, Federación de Trabajadores de la Región Española, an anarchist organization that was crushed and died because of the repression. In that same period of time, the first fissure appears between the anarchists that favored direct action, maybe terrorism, and the ones that didn't. This fissure will remain inside the anarchist movement until the Spanish Civil War. The state repression caused by the Mano Negra affair gave more ground to the direct action proponents. In 1879, the PSOE was also founded. The party logo, as you may see, is a bit different of the one that it has right now. The party was a worker, socialist and Marxist party. It developed mostly in Madrid with an artisan base, Asturias and Euskal Herria, in Catalan ground, where most of the industry lie, and the Andalusian fields will become anarchism fields. Through time, the unqualified workers, a growing specimen during the second half of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, will find themselves better between the anarchist ranks than with the PSOE intellectuals. In 1881, another famine struck the country, leaving thousands of death in the agricultural world. You see, most of Spain followed the monoculture, olives in the south, vineyards in the north, fruits in the fertile level. That means that most of the rural population relied just on one harvest, not having other subsistence alternative. If that went wrong, famine and death awaited. In 1885, King Alfonso XII died 25 years old. Her wife, that will give birth to a son in the upcoming month, will become the regent. Also in Barcelona, the Rose of Fire, an anarchist threw a bomb inside the Liceo, Barcelona's Opera House. To be more precise, there were two Orsini bombs, but just one exploded. 
killing 20 people. This was in reprisal for the death of another anarchist that tried, but failed, to kill Martinez de Campos that same year. In 1895, another war breaks out in Cuba, with a costful and brutal repression, reconcentración, that invaded American yellow press, General Weyler managed to almost control the situation by 1898, when the American Chrysler Maine exploded in the port of Havana. Though considered an accident, it served as an excuse for the USA to declare the war on Spain. Already in 1853, USA made an offer to buy the island to the Spanish government that was refused. And we know the interests America had on the island derived from the Monroe Doctrine and in late 19th century its sugar production. The war was a disaster for Spain. In two major naval battles the Spanish fleet was annihilated. The Spanish army, that in paper was superior to the American one, but was also spread in numerous garrisons, was also defeated. In two months, Spain lost its navy and its two remaining colonies, Philippines and Cuba. As a result of this war, a narrative similar to the stab in the back was created by the army and naval officers that perceived they had been abandoned by the government, making the fissure between the army and the people bigger. From the economic perspective, even Spain lost its colonies. There was a repatriation of capital that boosted a bit Spain's direct economy. The history of 19th century Spain does not differ a lot from the 20th century one, and we have to have this clear in order to understand what we'll be facing in the next episodes. In main terms, it's a history of misery and the history of an oligarchy that struggled to maintain its power and used all of its means to do so, its main weapons, repression and illiteracy. At the dawn of the 20th century, 70% of Spain's population was illiterate. How could Spain develop? It won't at least for its people. As the 20th century begins, as Preston says, the oligarchy will start to treat its own population in a colonial style. Graham, following the steps of Césaire and Aren, will talk about fascism as a colonialism brought home. Imagine, then, what will happen with this sort of mentality in the elites and their need to subjugate or annihilate whatever threatened the other. Imagine what will happen when they will turn against their population with the help of a colonial army, the Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. But the Spanish cockpit was made also by other recurrent elements. The conflict between Girondins and Jacobins, we could say, regarding the territorial administration affected also the Spain of the Patria Chica. The progression towards centralism of the 19th century, with exceptions the Carlist and the First Republic, spread its branches to the next generation of political figures from left to right. Opposing these centralistic views, we'll find the regional nationalisms that appeared during the period when this phenomena ride widely through the old continent. In a matter of time, they turned into political realities that will play key roles in the years to come. This century, after the abolition of the fueros, the regional laws in Euskal Herria and Navarra, after the Carlist defeats, as we've said, they opposed the Spaniards to Spain and the end of the Federalist dream of the First Republic saw Catalan and Basque nationalists plant their seed. Galician nationalism, a bit younger, will plant its seed in opposition to the provincial division of the state. Jacobins against Girondins. Most of the innovation of the 19th century came from the peripheric Greek areas that perceived threatened by the central state. And the conflict will come back again and again. A quick look at Spain history and geography shows us that Spain is full of diversity, not only in terms of culture or language, but also in terms of structures, economies, land property, systems, production. And one after another, centralistic views will fail to understand this and will harm their people. We left lots of stuff behind, as we've said. But the time, even if long, has been short. At least with this couple of episodes, we brought a bit of light to the situation in Spain during the 19th century. 
In this episode, we've inserted some new high technology, the photo. Please, don't forget to like the video and subscribe us. If you enjoyed it, share it. We have to bring light to the history of Spain. You can take it to school also, do it. And if you are able to support us in our Patreon channel, this could be also great. Thanks for your attention.